so pleased to be here. Okay, I know it's just after lunch, so I want to shake it off. You have to get up, shake it off a little bit more. I will make you get up and shake it off. Okay, so good afternoon. It's really great to be here. Uh, Virginia is uh, one of my favorite states, um, mostly because we're all so friendly, and it's like a homecoming every time I get to visit to say hi to everybody and catch up a little bit. So I do appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, as uh, an education specialist, a uh, public education specialist, I serve the central and mid-Atlantic region of the U.S., so kind of as far west as like Minnesota. Um, I believe Virginia is probably the most furthest southern state at this point, and then up around the mid-Atlantic, um, that New Jersey, New York area over there. Uh, NFPA has had a uh, public education network for uh, the past many, many years, since about 2007. And our network uh, spans all of the U.S. and Canada. So we have representation in each of the states, provinces, and territories. And uh, we had the pleasure uh, here in Virginia of having a, a fantastic um, network rep who served for many years. And so I want to acknowledge J.D. Jenkins, who was formerly in this position. We love J.D. and appreciate the, the work that he does and did. Um, we now have a new rep for Virginia, so I'm really pleased. I'm looking around for Chief Dyer. Did he slip out of here somewhere? He just, oh, he just went up home. Okay, we'll hackle him when he gets back in. All right. So actually, when he comes back in, would, would you guys just give him a nice warm okay. All right. Um, so Chief Dyer um, of the Virginia Fire Marshal Academy is now our net network rep for the Public Education Network. And I will be sure to put his contact information up at the end there so that if you don't um, have contact with him yet, please do reach out to him via email. And he'll include you on his distribution of information as it comes out to NFPA. And it's also to serve as a liaison for providing us feedback. So if you have some things to say, if you think there are resources or materials that you'd like to see, uh, please let us know. Because we want to produce things that are helping you do the really important work that you do. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, creating a public education experience. It will help me to know how many folks here in this room full-time work in, as a fire and life safety public educator. That is your primary function. What's your... Oh, what is your... How many people wear that hat part-time? All right. Anybody in here just hate public? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get that <laughs> All right. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is looking at a little bit about risk, talking a bit about data, and then how do we bring those two things together to create a successful, intentional public education experience. So I want you to consider a couple of questions, and this is the interactive portion of the program, okay? So first question I want you to think about is, what is public education? Now, I'm not above bribery, so I have one <laughs> challenge point here, Sparky 65th collector's item. Whoever wants to throw up their hand and get this conversation going. It's right here. Oh, are you sure? There we go. Got it. So, what is public education? Uh, educating the public about. <laughs> Okay. 
Why do we need public education? Why do we need this? Yes, sir. It would work better than some of the uh, operation stuff that we do. It can work better than some of the operations. We know it works, right? Yes, sir. And just to deliver um, you know, our public safety messages um, all types of fire education. Okay, so to deliver all kinds of education and messaging. We know it, we know it works, and we know it also saves lives. You want to add to that? Change that behavior in public to fire safety. You got it, sir. We're gonna get even you're drilling down even faster than we can get there. So we know it works, we know it can save lives, right? Now how do we do this? How do we do this work of pub ed? <clears throat> we have to figure out what our community is and what works for them. Because oh. different things work for different parts of the community. I'm glad you brought that up, Tiffany. So we have to figure out what works for our particular community, what are the needs, what are the risks, because truly if we're doing a good job with public education, then we've got this whole community risk reduction umbrella over it, right? Public education is one piece. But we have to look at, now, uh, analyze that data, do a, a community risk analysis, figure out what our risks are, and then figure out how we're going to reach folks, right? Oh, I have a hand up over here. I missed one. I'm sorry. Oh, well, and the other component is, is measure, being able to measure the results. Because if you don't have a way to measure it, there's no way to know if you were successful or not. There, this is a sharp group. Okay, because I was gonna, we're gonna make this point right now. What tools do we use? What are the tools that we use? And there are many. But what are some of the tools that we use? So how are you getting some of this? How are you communicating these messages out there? Yes. Through the kids. Through kids. So um, school visits, school presentations. <coughs> How else are you getting this? Incident call types. Incident call types. We're looking at our data. Social media. Social media. Okay, we have a lot of people over there. Social media has become a fantastic way to reach our public. It's a very inexpensive, direct, uh, as long as we know how to harness it, a great way to reach the public. Free stuff. <laughs> free. Give them away. Sending them home, something in their hands. Sure. Billboards, TDS, yes. Yeah. Campaigns, excellent. So many ways. So we know we have to communicate messages. You're going to add? Reaching out to the churches and the elderly communities. Those other groups that are out there, the older adult communities that are out there, and there are some specific <coughs> needs that we have to address with that group too. So we need to communicate targeted messages at our high-risk population. We have to have a sender, someone who has this information, this important education, a receiver, that group on the end is going to get the information, a channel for them to get it, right? And we need that feedback, as you pointed out to us, because we need to know if it's working. And finally, what is the overall goal with this thing called pub -Ed? Just to keep your chief out of your back? Or what else? Public safety. Public safety. <coughs> Tell me a little bit more. Reduce loss. Reduce loss. What was that? Change. Thank you, man. We really, at the end of the day, we want to change behavior. We need to modify behavior, start some behavior, stop some behaviors, but we know we need to change behaviors. Because people do what? They take risks. Okay? And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So, can we all agree that we take risks? Anybody in here drive over the speed limit? Never. Drink alcohol, not tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that won't be happening, right? <laughs> Eating junk food, we're probably all going to do that from time to time, some candy, favorite. Living in earthquake zones, flood zones, sure. So we think about all these messages and these risks, and people are bombarded with messages. It's hard to keep track of what you should concentrate on from day to day, right? How do I keep my family safe? Oh my gosh, no GMOs, put on my sunscreen, wear a helmet, all these, you know, get my flu shot, get my mammogram, get all the stuff. All important. So, in fire and life safety, public education, it becomes critical for us to take advantage of that important time that we have with the public, whether they're little people or big people, and make sure that we're making good, effective use of our time.
with them. And we're giving these messages, we're repeating the messages, and that we're having an impact with these messages. Because we compete in this space with so many other important messages. Now let's take a look at that. I like this quote because uh, there are so many groups that you work with in that, you know, if we've got the data, well, then let's use it. If we don't, then let's just use my opinion. We're just going to use it, right? So let's look at some of the top causes. This is from research at NFPA. Leading cause for home fires, still looking predominantly at cooking fires. And we move down to the note of the five there, leading causes, heating equipment, electrical, intentional, and then those smoking materials. If you jump over and compare it to home fire deaths, you see a little bit different scenario, the same five, but we've got smoking materials up here. So when we have deaths, we see a lot of smoking materials that are uh, related to those, those fires. Cooking equipment, again, at the, at the top there, and then heating equipment, electrical, intentional. But we know that they fall under usually one of these five. <coughs> Take a look at what's happened over the years with some of these leading causes. So here is our smoking material, and you can see sort of the decline there. We've reduced smoking really overall. We've moved our smokers outdoors. We've done some good work there. We still have those fired up, but it's definitely declined. Our heating, we also see a pretty steady decline there. Cooking kind of remained pretty constant. One of that electrical, arson, that intentional, and then <coughs> playing with the heat source, and finally candles. So you see that kind of convergence there. So overall, we have reduced home fires. The interesting thing about this stat is that we have a less <coughs> chance of having a home fire, but we have an increased chance of dying in a home fire if it should happen by 20%. If you haven't heard that stat, I think it's really, uh, really powerful. And it's due to a lot of those different things that go on with our homes now, with open construction and lightweight building materials and some of those things. But our chances of dying in a fire have actually increased in a home fire. So what does this mean for you? So looking at this national data, it's a great jumping off point. This is a good place to get your conversation started. Because what we don't want to do is just throw darts at this thing. What is our message here? Uh, what kind of message should we start with? So a great jumping off point. We know that we're going to be more successful. We're going to have a bigger impact if we can dig a little bit deeper into that and let that data tell a story. And your local stories are as important, if not more important. Because what you see from national trends may line up pretty closely to what you see in your local communities, or you might have to add to that story. So think about this this question here. What additional information do you have that can drive successful intervention? If you think about that in your local community, what information do you have? Tiffany started off the conversation with, look at what's happening in your community. How do you target? What works in your community? So just for discussion's sake, who can add to this question here? What information? Other additional information besides some of this national data? Educational work. Educational levels in your in your area can play a huge difference. Language barriers. Language barriers. This? Median income. Median income. Absolutely. Education. Education. Yep. A lot of different factors that can drive the success of how you develop your messaging. Okay. What was that? Just chit chat. Okay. Children. Oh, I'm gonna jump back. Children under five. Now, um, overall risk. Uh, relative risk for children under five. Does it seem to be about the average? Is there a greater risk of dying in a fire? Uh, less of a risk dying in a fire? We always get this greater, right? So I want to share some information with you. Before 2011, that was true. Children under five had a higher risk, but that's actually no longer true. <coughs> we have done a great job with those five P's of community risk reduction. That Education, enforcement, the economic impact, engineering, emergency response. We have really addressed this. And it doesn't mean we need to stop doing it because we've done a great job. But they're actually uh, overall lower 
risk. That's fantastic. But here's some key information. Risk for African American or black children is twice as high. So we can't look away from that. Heating and cooking cause more fire deaths than playing with fire. So we need to really have a clear view of what the fire problem is under five years old. And I also want to point out that non-fire cooking and heating burns are a concern that we need to keep on our radar. For adults over 65, we talk about that stop, drop, and roll message. Here's a group we need to be recognizing that needs to hear this message because death from clothing ignitions while cooking are more common for this age group than any other. And then we add on diminishing faculties, mobility, hearing, that can be huge. What other questions come to mind about victims of home fires with working smoke alarms in this demographic? What are you seeing in your local communities? Other things that can Forty. Okay. It can be a huge issue. <coughs> Cause delayed response. Makes uh, re search and rescue difficult. Escape difficult. A lot of times their homes are in disrepair. Okay, so maintenance of the home may not be kept up. So that can lead to potential issues and risks. Mm -hmm. Medications. Medications that people are on can make them drowsy. Uh, cause all kinds of cognitive impairments. <coughs> A lot of it. What about medical oxygen? We see that kind of across the country too. Sure. So let's not forget about this middle demographic here. Now it's not disproportionate on fires, but we see a whole lot of fire-related injuries, and it makes up about two-thirds of the total um, fire deaths. But why do you think we're seeing these injuries with this age group in here? Yeah, this is the group that's going to try to fight the fire. And they're going to delay emergency response because they're trying to fight the fire. Figure out a way. So smoking-related fires, is this a big issue in your community? We talk about those fire-related deaths. Compounding factors to the cooking issue. We talked about medications over here. Would that be a factor with cooking? Being under the influence of alcohol, drugs. All right, so how do we incorporate this data and recognize the risk and bring it into the stuff that you're already doing here? Those common things, those station tours, community events, when you have an invitation to present someplace, we want to look at how we weave in these important messages because we know that this is a critical time. If you have a station tour and you've got a captive audience there, we need to make sure that we're making good use of that time. And I included this little red hat up here when I was creating the slides because uh, it, it says a lot for me. We see them all the time. It's like the fire department's favorite giveaway, right? Kids love them, parents throw them away almost immediately. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, but we hand the kids, but it's almost like a shield. Like, oh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable that you're going to take my helmet. It's like, okay? Because for a lot of folks, the station tour idea and talking in front of a group is uncomfortable. It's like, how do I get to my home? It's fast enough to get these kids, give them, put, them, put it in their hand. But what I want you to think about is handing that helmet over. I still want you to do it. Hand the helmet over, but provide something with it. And this is where the messaging comes in. Something in that hat to go home with children. Oops. Okay, so let's talk about station tours. Station tours can be one of those things where it could be something planned out. You've got a group coming in. Uh, you've got a group of kindergartners that are coming in. You maybe don't know they're coming. It's spontaneous. People drop in. Could this be a, a dad and his son come in? They'd like to take a look at the trucks. And we welcome that, right? Uh, could be a number of different age groups. Could it be a group of, uh, could be a Rotary Club or somebody that wants to come over and take a look at the station, have a tour around. Um, a lot of fire departments have intake uh, request forms online and otherwise. How many people do that? So you've got a form for people to fill out. Okay, and they, very helpful. And then you have an idea of what's the age group that's coming in, when are they coming, where are they coming from, kind of what is their, what are their goals with this. So good things to consider. All right. So what's been your experience? I'd like to talk about this. How long should a station tour last? What do you think? 
that? 15 minutes, get him in out of there. As quick as we can, right? What However long else? is appropriate for the audience. Yeah. Say that again, sir? However long is appropriate for the audience. That's okay, so depending on the audience, that's going to make a difference, right? Do we want to do uh, an hour-long station tour with uh, preschoolers? Yeah. No, you might as well just hang yourself from the rafters, right? <laughs> Other input on uh, time? How many kids do you have? That's going to make a difference, too. We've got a really large group. It's going to be harder to kind of keep orderliness than if we have a smaller group. What if you get a call? What do you, what do, you do right now if you get a call? Anybody have a great plan, a backup plan for doing a call? They make a plan with the teacher ahead of time, telling them to either line up on the other side, outside, or somewhere if the kids are in a safe place, and then they answer the call. Okay, so coordinate with your uh, chaperones, your teachers beforehand. Fantastic. Because does this happen? Absolutely. You need to have a plan for that. Do you have a schedule right now? Do you wing it? In your 15 minutes, do you wing it? You have a lesson plan that you do? Okay, great. How many folks are just kind of like, oh, I just kind of walk them around? Okay, and that's okay because it, it happens. I'm not just here to make a judgment. We're just looking to bolster what you're already doing. What's your goal? How do we know what our goal is? Is that going to depend on the age group and the size and all these things? These are all factors, right? Okay, so what's your biggest fear? Anybody want to share? Yes, ma'am. My biggest fear is that somebody's going to find an interest in fire instead of fire safety. Okay, so making sure that we keep the focus on fire safety and we don't spark an interest in fire starting. Okay, that's reasonable. Other greatest fears with station tours? A lot of times the rookie is the one that's, you know, they're like, oh, rookie, do it. To, to making sure that they've got the correct messages and they're not using the wrong thing. Like saying, look, I'm not scary. Or, right, yeah. Fire I'm not I sound like Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah. Something scary. Excellent point. So we often put this on our OB for our rookies. Sure. Other fears? Come on, guys, we can talk about it. We're all friends here. <laughs> Somebody get hurt. Somebody getting hurt. I used to tell my duty crew all the time, let's try not to kill anybody while we're talking about safety, okay? Because sometimes you have those events. You might want a school yard, uh, one of somebody in a tanker, open up a valve, release water, and a little girl had just been standing in that spot where that water came spraying out, and I will never get over, oh my gosh, that could have been a huge tragedy. So let's not kill anybody when we're talking about safety. Okay, good rule of thumb. Great. So hopefully we'll try to, to uh, overcome some of these fears. So if you, even if you have this great plan, but you're not going to be there. It's your duty crew that's there. What happens if you're not there? <laughs> okay, so the show can go on, right? Here's the best thing. We live by these SOPs, these standard operating procedures or uh, GOGs. Um, having these uh, standard operating guidelines is really the foundation for how we respond to most incidents, right? And it's that baseline measurement, our standard, for how firefighters operate within it, right? Okay, so we're really familiar with with these types of standards. We want to put it in place something really similar for station tours, for community events, for those presentations. All right, so overall, I'm going to give you um, some things to think about. Key messages, and I'm going to use this very broad with kids, OK? So if you need a takeaway today, here's a good one. Key messages that you can cover in a station tour. Learn 911. Practice home fire drills. Have a meeting place. Don't hide. You can share what firefighters look like in their gear. Let kids get familiar and comfortable with the clean gear. We can talk about stop, drop, and roll. You see 
see that little parentheses. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. And of course, full fire trucks, because that's awesome. And it is. And now we're going to dig down a little bit deeper in some of these age, age range. So, preschool learning areas. Now we keep in mind, kids developmentally, cognitively, are ready for certain concepts at certain times. We all can agree on that. So, you can rely on NFPA's research, a uh, team of uh, developers for these programs, many of them educators. <coughs> you can be comfortable that these are appropriate <coughs> concepts for these different age groups. And I'm going to show you where to find these so you can go back and look later. So, you know, for preschoolers, firefighters are community helpers. When you hear the smoke alarm, get outside and stay outside. Practice the fire drill with your family. Stay away from hot things. Tell a grown up if you see matches or lighter. Now I want to remind you, for an effective station tour, you don't need to cover all of these messages. If we've got preschoolers, please don't tell them those five things. Tell them one thing. Okay? So pick one of those, and you can change it up when you have a group come back in the next time. Change the message, or you can repeat, because repetitive is good too. So if you're looking for these um, topic areas, they're under our Learn Not to Burn program. So when you visit the NFPA website and you see the public education tab there, over on the right under resources is educational programs. Okay? And you'll find Learn Not to Burn there. And it, it outlines the topic areas. Now another helpful hint is if you Google NFPA Learn Not to Burn, you'll get there a lot faster. Okay, so there are complementary resources and materials that are available for some of these things too. So I wanted to point out, we talk about home escape plans with the preschoolers. There's a great lesson plan around uh, Little Rosalie. And Little Rosalie has a music video in there, are some great games. And you can see over on the right how to put into order um, my escape plan. I hear the smoke alarm, I get up and move briskly, I get outdoors, and I meet at my family meeting place. Okay, so great enhancements if you're planning ahead for your station tour. The sound of the smoke alarm. Learn That Learn also has some great uh, little uh, clips, audio clips, and you can play for the kids the sound of a horn honking, a fire engine a siren, a dog barking, and why are these things important that they're loud because they need to get people's attention, right? Just like our smoke alarm. So some great little clips here that you can use. Kindergarten learning areas. They look pretty similar. We add on a, a, a little bit, kind of dig a little deeper on some of these. But again, smoke alarms are important. Get outside, stay outside. Now we're going to talk about our fire drill at school because we've got kindergartners who can recognize that we do this drill at school, and it's important to do it at home. Stay away from hot things. Matches and lighters are for grown-ups. Firefighters, again, are community helpers. So enhancements. In the Learn Not to Burn program, you'll find um, a lesson plan on community helpers. If you want to go into that, you want to put on your gear, share what firefighters do, why it's important. Grade one, similar. Report an emergency comes up, and then looky here at the bottom. Know when to stop, drop, and roll. So let's pause for a second and talk about that. I'm actually going to share an enhancement there. Uh, again, kids are ready for certain topics at certain times. And we have done such an amazing job with the stop, drop, and roll uh, uh, line uh, activities. Uh, it's kind of, again, it's like the red helmets almost with the, with the fire service. Kids are going to. Like, when all else fails, well then, by God, stop, drop, and roll. Okay? Now, the problem is, when we deliver this message for kids that are too young, Conceptually, they're not able to understand, and they get it very confused with what to do if their house is on fire. And I'm sure if you've ever asked a group of preschoolers what to do if their house is on fire, you may get the response, stop, drop, and roll. Okay. Um, but again, I go to, I have a um, little guy who's a kindergarten, kindergarten this year, was a preschooler last year. My local fire department went and visited, and I said, what did they talk about? And he said, stop, drop, and roll. And we've been working it out ever since then. So <laughs> it's confusing. So please. Um, help us by not delivering this before <coughs> that grade one, okay? But there's a great um, uh, enhancement piece to go with this. Grade two, we've 
at many of the same things. They're going to dig a little bit deeper, talking about kid-free zones at home. And we'll look at those as well. Here's a great piece with reporting an emergency, though, is how do we teach kids on smart devices? Because we're not using those landlines very often anymore where it's as simple as picking up your phone and dialing 911. Do we need to get past that, um, the security code? Teach them where that emergency button is in the corner of the phone. Um, really key lesson. So this could be an important one to do with uh, your middle elementary age kids, starting with second grade on this one. So grades three through six, we get a few more topics here. We start to talk about carbon monoxide, a little bit about cooking safety. This is an age when we start to have kids that are home, maybe uh, making themselves a snack or getting in the kitchen. You sleep a little later in the morning than your child. You know they're doing something in the kitchen. So how do we start talking about cooking safety? Uh, 911, and then educating their families. Kids can be instrumental in going home and delivering some of these messages to family members. I know every fire prevention week, Kids go home and drive their parents crazy with creating an escape plan, even if you've done it every single year, and we're proud of that. Okay, it's a great way to get messages. In fact, I, I, it makes me always think about when my oldest son was in about fifth grade, and they were talking about um, addictive properties um, and different things, and uh, he would come home and talk to us about stuff, and one morning my husband and I were having coffee, read the newspaper, and my husband lifted up his coffee cup to take a drink, and on the bottom was a sticky note that said, addicted to caffeine. And I was like, he strikes again. So, <laughs> they are very good. You know, the seatbelt police in your car, um, they're excellent at reminding parents and family members about safety. Some great videos that you can share uh, with kids, too. Firefighters Weird History, it's a fantastic video about some of the practices long ago, um, some of those weird uh, um, methods like, dip, are you guys familiar with um, using your ears, dipping water, cleaning them off their filtration system, that is so gross, but so there's some cool stuff about that, and then like futuristic firefighting. Music videos, we have several. Um, very good, a lot of fun, kids love them. Um, this one here uh, about the sound of a smoke alarm. Home escape plans. I'm going to play a, our quick fire safety minute. NFPA has a YouTube channel now for kids. Fire safety is a big topic. Big, huge, giant. And it's so important, we're talking life saving important. So let's take a minute out of our day to plan your home fire escape and learn exactly how we can help our families stay safe in a fire. We'll cover the most essential things you need to know in planning your escape. Let's set the timer and go. First thing you want to do is draw a really simple map of your home. Be sure to include all doors and windows. Now visit each room. Can you find two ways out of each one? Have your parents check all the windows and doors to make sure they're ready and safe to access. Now that you have your escape route, it's time to test your smoke alarms. Have an adult push the test button on each alarm in your home to make sure it has good batteries. <laughs> the next step to planning your escape is to make sure that you have a safe meeting place outside. This meeting place should be a place that never moves. Think mailbox or tree, not car or bike. Now that we have a plan, make sure to go over it with everyone in your home. Post the instructions somewhere like your fridge or bulletin board for a regular reminder, along with the emergency phone number for your fire department. And practice the whole fire drill twice a year. That's it. Now you have a fire escape plan. And we even have five seconds to spare. Let's use that time to give a little love to Sparky the Fire Dog. Okay. So just a quick uh, note there about some of the great quick videos that you can share. Uh, also, uh, some other pieces, Penelope, uh, Perfect Penelope, just a great little story, one pager about Penelope, who's perfect at everything, but she's caught off guard uh, in a lesson when a firefighter visits the classroom and they talk about home escape plan and she does not have one. Um, so, good conversation starter for kids, those pieces there on actually creating your home escape plan. Uh, a little bit about cooking safety. We've got a great video library. I'll show you where to find all of these videos. Um, 
Um, this one still makes me laugh. It's like Sparky as Julia Childs, very funny. Um, so, yeah, some good humor there. Other topic areas under safety, um, cooking again, learning from parents when it's okay, talk about using the microwave safely um, without having to reach up to get things out of the microwave, opening the lid away from their face, how to treat burns, and many, many games and apps. We know that kids learn through technology now, not just with it, through it. So as often as you can, get to them on their level with technology. And there's a lot available on sparky.org. And so what I want to um, have you think about now is incorporating this into your station tour. So wherever you start your station tour, whether you're coming through your day room or you're starting in your kitchen, your administrative office, wherever it may be, I want you to think about how to tie in some of these messages. Now, side note, your kitchens all look like that, right? right. Isn't that awesome? I went down this route a whole good day. You start um, searching images of fire station kitchens, it gets very interesting. So there's a, this is Galaxy, so pretty cool. Anyway, um, the three foot zone around uh, the stove. Uh, stay in the kitchen while you're cooking. What's hot and not hot. Keeping matches and lighters locked up. Extinguishers, microwave safety, how to treat a burn. Again, all things you can talk about right in that kitchen area. And there are some great pieces that you can do with handouts. Again, this is from Learn Not to Burn. Um, you could hand out to kids this little circle of hot things and talk about right there in the kitchen area with some of our little guys. What's hot, what's not. Have them uh, give you the, the stop, it's hot, or no, it's not hot. A letter to go home with parents. Another little video there, hot and sometimes hot and not hot. More handouts here. And again, you can touch and talk about those things right in the kitchen. They're accessible. Kids get a little bit older. There's some resources about that three foot zone. You can measure that out with them to show them how far back they should be from the oven and stove top. When you get to your day room, your bunk room, a lot of your messaging there can be tied into exactly what we talk about for home fire safety. So point out your smoke alarms, point out your sprinklers. Talk about in your in your bunk room or your dorm rooms uh, having two ways out. Point out those two ways in there. How you get low under smoke. Get out and stay out, having that meeting place. Uh, also, a good time to chat with uh, children about if they live in a high-rise or apartment building. Things you can tie in, in your day room there. If you have a smart TV, or a TV that's uh, internet connected, which so many of them are now, a uh, great chance to show some of those videos. Have a video shoot up, um, share that with kids. And I'll give you a, a little tip here, too, with videos. It's a great chance for you to take a little break, turn the video on, collect your thoughts, think about what's next. A little, a little chance to just take a breath, OK? So we have our little Rosalie again. Firefighters are on the way. Great video about what firefighters do, um, the gear that they put on, uh, their work that they do in the community. What's that sound? Um, again, that fun uh, music video with the smoke alarm sound. And then, of course, many apps that you could also uh, access on a smart TV. Other educational videos, we have our iSpy. Um, I just showed you the Fire Safety Minute, which is just a real quick one. Making a Home Escape Plan, whose hat is that? And that's about that firefighter as a community helper. Hot or not. A great one on Chicago, the great Chicago fire. It ties into fire prevention week and why we uh, commemorate this uh, health observance. And then I mentioned the firefighters' facts and weird history. You can find all of these on our website again if you go into that PubEd tab. On the bottom right, you see that video library. You can find all of them there. And when all else fails, you can read them a book. Kids love to be read too. Pieces on uh, high rise. If you need to address or want to address um, home escape from a high rise, we have some great pieces there. And finally, when you move on to your apparatus bay, things you can talk about there besides your pool truck, seatbelt use. Why is that important? Do our firefighters wear seatbelts? Is it important to have car seats and booster seats? Why we need to pull over? We we uh, see lights, hear sirens. How important it is to only call 911 in an emergency. And then in many of your apparatus bay, you'll find 
People, uh, stations typically have like a workbench, tool area, or even the tools that you have on your shop, you could get into a little bit of that toys versus uh, tools. Oops. And again, there's some great pieces. Two more videos on just exploring the truck. Sparky takes us through exploring truck and types of trucks. And then you see in the right hand corner, a uh, handout on tools versus toys. Coloring sheets, if you want to provide something for kids to take away um, after uh, <coughs> visiting and doing a truck touch um, or looking at firefighter gear, and again, the um, firefighters are on their way using video. And many e-books. So outside of actually reading a, a actual tangible book, there are some great e-books. I want to pause there for a second. Any questions regarding station tours, <coughs> input, input feedback, or things that happened to your head that you thought, we're doing this well, I want to share this with the group? Yes, sir. Um, so the publications, the things you're handing out, things to get ideas from as you're putting them together. And Chief Harris, I'm going to put you on the spot over there. It was several years ago, uh, Virginia State Firefighters partnered up with uh, some grant writers, and they produced a community safety manual to, it was free to all fire departments in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And it was a pretty thick book, and it had, you know, slides for each page. You could pull it out and run a photocopy. had a little watermark, place your logo here. So it was great stuff for you to pass out. And it had the electronic versions as well. So I think they're still available. I reached out to um, uh, Nugent and um, uh, the guys that wrote the grant, and I received one. He happened to have an electronic copy. But if you don't have one at your department, we might want to look to see if they're still around. I know they exist electronically, but they are great. It talks about assisted senior livings, things for their, you know, everything from grade school all the way up, and it's already done. Um, I don't know if you want to speak on it or not, Chief, but it was a really great project. It was coupled up with a couple of the different large associations. Yeah. So a great uh, enhancement or, or a piece to refer to. So thank you for sharing that. And um, I'm actually glad, glad that you brought that up too because I do want to point out that the resources that I shared with you um, already today are all free resources through NFPA. So if you want to access those, they're all downloadable from the website. So many things that you have at your fingertips. It doesn't have to cost your department money. Things that you can rely on to enhance what you're already doing in your station tours. All right, community events, which can sometimes be as simple as a truck touch in front of a big box store, right? We get asked to do those a lot because they draw attention and people into the, uh, the place of business just by simply being there. Okay, it's fantastic. So things to consider. We know that um, it can be difficult to engage a, a little bit because you've got limited time with the people that are you know, passing through shoppers or getting an audience. You may get small groups from time to time. So it's going to be really important that we have a hook to get uh, a conversation going or, or catch their interest, capture their interest. Props can be really helpful. Um, in regards to smoke alarms, um, and, you know, these are things you can consider just talking about, the big three smoke alarms, CO, escape <coughs> Um Having a, a prop like an old smoke alarm that's yellowed and funky looking, like some of them that used to and people may still have in their homes, versus some of the really new, cool things that are out there, um, the, the dual um, photoelectric ionization, the interconnected, wireless, there's a lot of really cool things out there. Um, CO, same thing. Escape plans, maybe even do a contest where you have, you give away a grid, um, have people go home and complete it and, and snap a picture and email you a copy to participate in a, in a contest of some sort. So something to be uh, interact, interactive with folks. Most important uh, element here is planning your messaging. Okay, so you can really do that around what uh, this event type is. So considering where you are, where you're going, is it a Home Depot or talking about smoke alarms, that'll be a good one to, to fall back on. Or am I going to be someplace else where uh, perhaps another topic would be a better fit? But having a plan in advance. And I really want to stress that it is not just the job of your fire and life safety educator to do the education. It is the job of everyone in your fire department. So if it's your, uh, your duty crew that's out there, whether they're a, a brand new rookie probie or they're someone who is um, seasoned, 
uh, they should be able to deliver some messaging if we help them with that, uh, that standard operating guideline, if you will. And one of the um, key resources for this uh, that I want to point out to you is NFPA's 10 minute lessons. If you didn't know that these were here, um, this is great information for you. I hope uh, some folks are already using these. But these 10 minute lessons all have a hook to capture people's attention get a conversation going, and it doesn't need to be a long, drawn-out conversation. So again, if you've got a group that's walking by your fire uh, engine and you start to kind of congregate and look at something in particular, you could start one of these lessons uh, very easily and, and get them in a conversation about a particular topic. You can see all the different topics listed there. Um, new topics come out all the time. And I'm going to share the hook with you on a couple of these because I think they're fun. So this one is on multi-generational living, which is actually becoming more and more popular as uh, families try to figure out uh, how to share resources, uh, childcare, and if you were like me in the sandwich generation where you've got small children but also aging parents that need help. It feels like help, but a lot of us live there. So um, <laughs> multi-generation. <laughs> multi-generation. My parents live across the street too. That makes it even better. Um, you can ask folks, um, okay, if you're going to spend an evening out, ladies and gentlemen, you guys can play along, what would be something that you plan for you and your significant other or a friend, uh, buddy that you're going to uh, go out and enjoy together? What would you do? I don't have any more points. What would you do with your spouse or Mark, you would <laughs> oh my gosh, are you, are you married? Yeah. You're still married? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, no? Anyone who looks like they move, I want to call. Okay, thank you, Justin. Go to the next restaurant? Sure, Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, anything after the restaurant or just that would be nice? I mean, that's fantastic if you just did it Yes, sir? Go to ball game. Go to ball game. Okay, something like that. So you've got this plan. You're going to go uh, to have a nice meal, maybe go to ball games, in whichever order. How does that change if you are taking your 85-year-old aunt or uncle with you? We're not going out to eat. Not even happening. They're paying. Leave two hours early. <laughs> right? A lot of bathroom breaks. Okay. Special seating mobility is going to be an issue. The time you eat is probably going to be an issue, right? We're going at 4.30 instead of 6.30? Okay. Now, what can you add to that? You're going to take along your two-year-old. Grandchild, niece, nephew, child. You're just not a dog. I know, my husband just said it. He's like, just okay. Yeah. How would that change? Are you going to the same restaurant? No. Are you going to be able to enjoy your food? Baseball game, sounds like it's a nightmare, right? Okay, so it's a fun conversation to start and then tie that into how you create your home escape plans. Because it's going to be different if you have an older relative um, in the home that you have to consider their strength, mobility, getting windows open. How are we going to account for Aunt Edna or Grandma or whomever's in the home? And it's going to be different if you also have uh, and or have small children in the home as well, right? We can't rely on a two-year-old to get himself out. So how do we incorporate making sure that we can do that as quickly as possible and that's a part of our plan? Okay, so great, great hook. Here's another one. Show you these couple of pictures. What do you think about that uh, picture on the left there? Can you see what's going on? <laughs> that is what one safe looking restraint, isn't it? <laughs> It's basically just propping this kid up so he can, you know, look out the window. And how about this gentleman over here on the right? What's he doing? He's not, yeah, he's in the hospital. I think that's awesome. Because these were completely acceptable behaviors years ago, right? My dad built a bunk in the back of our Toronto, so we could drive to Florida and, like, lay down and sleep. He's never thinking about being like trajectory out the window should we have in half of the Okay. Didn't need to we didn't wear seat belt. Um this gentleman's smoking in a hospital bed. 
completely normal. I mean, there used to be people would have an ashtray on their desktop at work. You smoke, you know. Now, oh my gosh, you smell smoke and somebody's complaining, right? Great way to bring in this uh, public health and what we see is acceptable and how that's an evolution. And let's talk about home fire sprinklers, okay, and where that's going and why they're important. So another great hook. So all these 10 minute lessons have a great hook like that. I think they're welcome. Resources to accompany all kinds of resources, handouts that you can download for free from NFPA. Um, you can see some of the, the big three here, the smoke alarms, escape, carbon monoxide, but we have tip sheets that cover everything. And they're coming out all the time. And I'll tell you what, you never know what to expect. Like this is a new one, backyard chicken coop safety. <laughs> Who knew that was going to be a fire hazard? But apparently, people are catching their garages and, and uh, houses on fire because they're trying to do the in the city. All right, no judgment. Hoarding, we talked about that. Clothes dryers. Um, so you see really niche things, um, Shabbat and fire safety, um, some practices, religious practices, uh, and you'll see some really uh, routine ones. Med medical oxygen. I just made a whole new word. Medical oxygen. Uh, Smoking. That so there's a number of different tip sheets. Download them for free. You can put your fire department information right there on them. Uh, we'll provide a link for more information <coughs> and hand those out at community events. Send people home with something. And lastly, these invitations to present. For some of you, very excited. Can't wait to get there and do a presentation. For everybody else, this can be terrifying. Okay. And it depends on the age group. Age group. One, of, uh, one of our firefighters, who's also a police officer, uh, years ago, he let me dress him up as Eddie the Eagle a couple of times. And then um, in visiting the kindergartners, he said, I would rather deal with um, gangbangers or a cartel than kindergartners. Like they scared <laughs> He just was not comfortable with a really big guy, too. So he was afraid he was going to smush kids as he's walking around. It can be terrifying. For some people visiting older adults and talking to older adults, I don't, I don't know what to talk about. I get that, okay? So when you have these invitations to present, please remember these lessons. So we have 10-minute lessons, but we also have 30-minute and 60-minute lessons. And we even have a template for you to create your own lesson. So you can think about a hook, think about what you want to cover for content, and then make sure that uh, you're checking comprehension of folks. Okay, so we've kind of done the, uh, the legwork for you already. So please um, be sure to take a look at those. We just put out some new early adolescent lesson plans too, and I'm really excited about these because this is an age group, these middle schoolers that we um, overlook quite a bit, but people ask about um, quite often. What can we deliver to, to this age group? So you can see there on um, the topics, making safe, responsible choices, careers in the fire service, that's a great one. Um, teens who care for themselves or maybe uh, siblings at home. And there's actually a fourth one now on cooking safety. So it, it asks him, uh, the hook is when you come home from school, like how hungry are you? Like on a scale from one to 10. Like most middle schoolers will be like just a raging 10. Let's start, okay? Then how do we prepare something that's not gonna catch the hunger? Okay. So great little kind of lessons for kids. That older adult, older adult audience that can be challenging and tricky. Um, and this, this honestly is a topic that we could spend a whole day on, this uh, program called Remembering When. How many folks are, are familiar already with Remembering When? Okay, you guys are my favorites. Everybody else, um, Remembering When, this is a fantastic program uh, developed with NPA and NPC, and it addresses not only the eight leading causes for fires, but also the eight leading causes for slopes and falls with older adults. And everything you need to deliver this program, you can get right on the website, download, um, walk through those messages. But if you've been invited to speak at an older adult community and you're not sure what to cover, please refer to this program. It gives you um, directives on how to create a presentation, what to include, props you may want to consider, and then also that content that you'll be looking for. And I'll come back another day and we'll spend a whole day. Is that sound exciting? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, tailored messages. I want to point this out to you. Um, this is our educational messages advisory committee. Uh, 
Um, this group is a real think tank that comes together periodically, and they represent um, all kinds of different uh, agencies in the, in the um, safety community, American Red Cross, uh, Consumer Safety Product Commission, UL, um, a lot of fire departments, um, some of those subject matter experts, um, our folks even at NFPA and engineering, electrical, and they make sure that our messages are on target, that they are current, uh, that they are um, effective, and in this desk reference that you see up there, you can download again, this is a free uh, resource for you, it really should be like the educator's Bible. This isn't something we're going to share with the public because it's not exciting reading and it's pretty technical. But you can derive out of there those core messages and then make them uh, customized for the groups that you want to work with. Okay, but please be aware. One of the best things about this resource is that it helps us create consistency. Um, so it's going to be really important, and I'll, I'll share a couple of concepts out of that. If we're uh, referring to smoke alarms and smoke detectors and those are two different things, right? So we need to get on the same page when we're talking about uh, smoke alarms, smoke detectors. Um, big issue a couple years back was sleeping with the door closed. And we know that that definitely slows down the spread of uh, fire and smoke, correct? There's so much more that goes on in crafting these messages because we have to consider, really need to have working smoke alarms in place and have them in the sleeping areas and outside of the sleeping areas, interconnected preferably if we're telling people to sleep with their doors closed, right? Because we don't know where that fire might start, and if it starts in the, in the sleeping area itself, then that may not be the message that we're wanting to share. So there's more that goes on, and, I, and I'm so proud of this group that gets together and does all that thinking behind these messages. Okay, and this is what we use to weave into all of our materials and resources. There is a submission form. If you think there are things that need to be added, edited, changed, please, please participate. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with a couple of uh, tips here at the end for success. Breadth versus depth. So just give some thought. I know I mentioned there are different time frames that you may be working with in. Ten minutes at a community event to uh, maybe an hour-long presentation or 40 minutes someplace. Be very careful that we don't go for breadth always and add more topics. And that can be one of the um, things that we fall into in the fire service because there's so many things we want to share, right? So if we talk about smoke alarms, well then let's add in car carbon monoxide and let's add, add in home escape plans and let's add in, we, now we've got people leaving with, what did I get out of this? Let's stick with smoke alarms and let's talk more about those, okay? Why are they so important? And what's the expiration date on our old smoke alarms? When do they need to be changed out, okay? Leave them with the different types of what they might want to consider for their family. So go for that uh, depth rather than breadth. Technical language. The lingo that we use. Really important that we consider our audience and uh, the age of that audience. One of my favorite stories uh, my colleagues shared, uh, Karen Barrera Reed, if you know Karen, was observing a uh, station tour. And the gentleman that was delivering uh, the information on the uh, aerial ladder truck kept mentioning aerial. And the little first grade girls kept perking up every time they say aerial. And of course, you know what they were thinking. <laughs> totally different aerial. So stick to the language that they understand. And lastly, we applaud you in whatever role you serve in, in the fire service or otherwise, because saving lives comes in lots of different forms. And it certainly does come in the form of education as well. So keep up your, your efforts. Please reach out. I'm going to take just a second for questions, and I want to point out there's Chief Garrett Dyer's uh, contact information. Um, if you'd like to be on his uh, list for getting in for information from NFPA, jot that down. Let's just call email him, shall we? Just for the fun of it. Everybody just emails Chief Dyer. <laughs> he enjoyed his week this week. Can I take any quick questions? Comments? Compliments? No criticism. I have a compliment. Thank you for making these materials free of charge. I remember the day when one video was three and four hundred dollars. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So I just wanted to tap on that just for a second. Um, and part of this 
this uh, group here, everyone's sort of in here looking at what other folks are doing, um, and I'll just throw this out for us. Um, as a new uh, firefighter, when I started with the Charleston Fire Department, and uh, Tiffany sort of said it a little while ago, um, the rookie is the person that it seems to always get the job of. The kids are coming to the station for a station tour, or getting ready to go to a, a <coughs> to do an engine demo, and whoever the most junior person on the rig or in the station, they're the ones going to do the tour. And I've been there, and I can tell you, uh, to be told that morning at 8 o'clock, hey, at 8.30, there's going to be a group of kids here, and you're going to have to talk to them. It may not be scary for everyone, but there are some folks that that's terrifying that they got to talk to these kids. So one of the things that uh, we did in Charlottesville, and most of the stuff you saw up there, we grabbed off the NFPA's website. They were just PDF documents, and they were 30, sec or 30 minutes. It was one single message. And you can tell someone, look, these kids are coming, here's the age group, and here's the message. You can read it to them if you need to. It was a game changer for the, for the guys on the ship because at that point they didn't have to do anything. There was no more preparation. These kids were coming. We're going to show them the engine. we got to go out. It's 30 minutes. Here's the information. We do it, and we have a good time and come back. And they don't get lost in and, and a big broad message, or trying to figure out what they need to say, or who they're talking to, um, it's really important uh, for them to have that resource. So we created a library, and we we took stuff from other fire departments. I called around, Joe called around, hey, what do you guys got? And we got volumes of stuff. It didn't take long, um, a couple of months worth of practice of just grabbing stuff. We had an, a complete library that covers from preschoolers and folks. I don't know what your area looks like, but Charlottesville is not a very big city, and there's a bunch of preschools that, and when this kind of weather starts happening, and we've already started seeing it, they want something to do. They want to get out of that building and bring those 5, 10, 20 kids somewhere, like a little field trip, and the fire station is right around the corner, so guess where they're coming. And if you don't have a message for them, if you don't have something like that written down, they're going to get all kinds of stuff. Whether you think the guys are doing a great job or not, they're going to do whatever they need to do, and every ship, and every engine company, and every person is going to do it a little different. So if it's already written down for them, they're going to, they're going to be able to read it, and it's going to be delivered. It's going to be a program you can stay in line. Um, so take advantage of what's out there. Take a look at what's out there. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there. You can build a library quick, and it's, it's beneficial to your suppression folks. So thank you, Meredith. Uh, you're in.